Income tax 2023-2024, residential rental property introduction. Get ready and some coffee because we need extreme concentration when doing income tax preparation 2023-2024. Listen, first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because... Apparently, we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Information comes from publication 527 residential rental property, including rental of vacation homes tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. The rental income typically ultimately rolling into line one income of the individual income tax formula remembering the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement having income minus instead of expenses deductions resulting in instead of net income taxable income the rental income typically reported on the schedule e the schedule e similar to a schedule c which is used for sole proprietorship is basically an income statement in and of itself having the rental income minus the rental expenses which are basically rental deductions resulting in in essence net rental income which is what rolls into line one income of the formula the formula outlining the calculation on the form 1040 this being the first page of the form 1040 where this rental income ultimately rolls into line eight additional income from schedule one this is the schedule one additional income and adjustments to income part number one additional income the schedule e ultimately rolling into line five rental real estate royalties partnership as corporation attached schedule e this is the schedule e supplemental income and loss from rental real estate royalties so on and so forth which typically has an income statement type of format applied to the rental properties all right, we're going to get into some of the standard items and some of the things that change from year to year. So we'll first start off about or on those things that are different from the prior year to the current year. If you're completely new to rental income, we'll then get into just the start to finish of the general concepts and ideas of how to be reporting the rental income. So the standard mileage rate, this is one of the things that are gonna change basically from year to year because they typically will need to increase it with inflation. So for 2023, the standard mileage rate for the cost of operating your car, van, pickup, or panel truck increased to 65.5 cents per mile. This is similar to a question we often have with the Schedule C situation. What changes from year to year? Well, the mileage is often something that's going to have to change because when we think about the mileage, it's often something that we can use as a deduction for our business, in this case, for our uh, rental property. And uh, you would have to, you could use either the mileage rate or you can use the actual uh, deductions. And if you're gonna use the mileage rate, they have to basically update uh, that rate uh, from year to year for inflation. Section 179 deduction limits. For tax years beginning in 2023, the maximum section 179 expense deduction is 1,160,000. This limit is reduced by the amount by which the cost of section 179 property placed in service during the tax years exceeds 2,890,000. 179 deduction has to do with depreciation depreciation being very important for rental property because the property itself is going to have a depreciation component to it but we also might have equipment or other things in the property which we have to put on the books as depreciable assets that we that we need to then apply the depreciation rules 179 deduction is uh allows us oftentimes for certain types of property to deduct more upfront 
And so we have another course or section that dives more into just depreciation in and of itself. We might talk more in this section about basically the depreciation that's going to be related to, you know, the rental property uh, itself. So 179, similar kind of situation that it has depreciable property. It's going to impact the Schedule E, any kind of business, typically a Schedule E or possibly a Schedule C situation. Qualified paid sick leave and qualified paid family leave payroll tax credits. So generally, the credit for qualified sick and family leave wages as uh, enacted under the Family's First Coronavirus Response Act, the FFCRA, and amended and extended by the COVID-related tax relief Act of 2020 for leave taken after March 31st, 2020 and before April 1st, 2021, and the credit for qualified sick and family leave wages under sections 3131, 3132, and 3133 for the Internal Revenue Code as enacted under the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, the ARP for leave taken after March 31st, 2021 and before October 1st, 2021 have expired. So obviously, when we have this whole situation with the uh, coronavirus situation, a bunch of laws, the tax code was used as one of the primary tools to try to to cope <laughs> with the whole uh, situation. And one of the situations was, of course, that people were closing down because of the social distancing rules. And then they tried to keep uh, employment up by basically giving incentives for employment and sick relief and so on and so forth. So at this point, hopefully we're kind of getting back to normal with regards to those strange laws, because of course, with the laws, we want to have kind of consistency with them so that we can understand what's happening for projections going forward and so that we can keep up with the compliance uh, with the laws. So hopefully that whole that whole thing is over and we can get to some kind of back to business, some kind of standardization, conformity, consistency of some kind. However, employers that pay qualified sick and family leave wages in 2023 for leave taken after March 31st, 2020 and before October 1st, 2021 are eligible to claim a credit for qualified sick and family leave wages if the quarter of 2023 in which the qualified wages were paid. For more information, see Form 941, Line 11B, 11D, 11 or 13C, 13E, and Form 944. So in other words, this is something that's going to be related to the payroll. So if you have a business, whether that be a Schedule C business, or now we're talking about rental property, possibly a Schedule E, if you've got payroll related to it, then that's usually when you're, this might uh, kick in. If you don't have any payroll related to it, this might not apply because, of course, you would not be filing the Form 941 and the four, or the Form 944 related to payroll. So you must include the full amount, both the refundable and non-refundable portions of the credit for the qualified sick and family leave wages in gross income on line three or four of Schedule E, Form 1040, as applicable for the tax year that includes the last day of any calendar quarter with respect to which a credit is allowed. A credit is available only if the leave was taken after March 31st, 2020, and so on and so forth. So note so a credit is available only if the leave was taken after March 31st, 2020 uh, 20, and before October 1st, 2021 and only after the qualified leave wages were paid, which might under certain circumstances not until, occur until a quarter after September 30th, 2021, including qualified quarter payments made during 2023. Accordingly, all lines related to qualified sick and family leave wages remain on the employment tax returns for 2023. All right, commercial clean vehicle credit. So now we have these credits. Obviously, some of the credits that the government is trying to incentivize is uh, cleaner fuel. These are kind of like green energy uh, type of credits. As we look at these credits, again, we can debate as to how impactful or effective they are at achieving their goal and what are the consequences of them in, in terms of the economy as well. So in other words, are they, are they making things cleaner? Are they costing more? Is the cost versus the making thing cleaner uh, uh, comparable or worth our, worthwhile? And the complications to the, to the tax code also uh, lends to some kind of problems as well. It seems to me that what we should be spending most of our time on is innovating 
so that instead of making clean energy cheaper through through subsidies, we we make it we get to the point where we've innovated to the point that uh, that that uh, better sources of fuel, cleaner sources of fuel are actually marketable. They're cheaper on the market because we, we've gotten smarter about it. But business that buy a qualified commercial clean vehicle may qualify for a clean vehicle tax credit. So see form 8936 and its instructions for more information. So you can still look into the credits for a clean vehicle. And again, just from a policy standpoint, I kind of just have to touch on it because these are policies that are big debates right now with regards to how do we deal with these clean energy things. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if the vehicles got to the point that you didn't need to subsidize them for people to buy them because they're actually more efficient than the energy cars that are on gas because of technology, right? That's to me, that's where we want to be able to go. We want to be investing so that we don't have to subsidize the green vehicle cars because because they would be competing on their own because we've increased our understanding of energy and, and how to how to, to use it more efficiently and so on and so forth. So that's and I think, you know, people like an Elon Musk are, are getting more better at that, right? There he's I think he's improving through innovation, not so much by just taking, you know, tax credits. I'm not sure that's gonna get us there. But in any case, bonus depreciation. The bonus depreciation deduction under section 168K begins its phase out in 2023 with a reduction of the applicable limit from 100% to 80%. So bonus depreciation has to do with more accelerated depreciation up front and it's it's intended to kind of uh, stimulate the economy. So now we've got that 179 deduction related to depreciable property and the bonus depreciation. Again, we'll talk about depreciation a little bit more as it relates to the rental property itself, other things like equipment and other things uh, we might touch on, but we have another course or section that dives a little bit deeper into the workings of depreciation in terms of maker's depreciation and the different class lives other than the class lives of the actual rental property, which we'll look at here. So reminders, uh, net investment income tax, the NIIT, so you may be uh, subject to the NIIT. NIIT is a 3.8% tax on the lesser of net investment income or the excess of modified adjusted gross income, MAGI, over the threshold amount. Net investment income may include rental income and other income from passive activities. One of the things that differentiates uh, the rental income from what we report on the Schedule C, remember those two things are similar in nature. You might say, hey, look, the Schedule C is basically an income statement that pulls into line one of the Form 1040. The Schedule E is basically another income statement that pulls into line one of the Form 1040. What is the difference between these two things? Well, one of the differences is rental income is more likely to be considered passive uh, type of income, which could run into different rules and regulations related to passive income, such as the net investment income tax and possibly uh, with regards to limitations on losses, for example, could also have benefits in that you might not be subject to the self-employment tax uh, with the with passive income, the Social Security and Medicare, whereas with the Schedule C, that is a big deal, the self-employment uh, tax calculation. So use Form 8960 to figure this tax. For more uh, information on NIIT, go to irs.gov forward slash NIIT. Form 7205, Energy Efficient Commercial Building Deduction. This form and its separate instructions are used to claim the Section 179D deduction for qualified energy efficient commercial building expenses. Excess business loss limitation. So if you report a loss on line 26, 32, 37, or 39 of your Schedule E Form 1040, you may be subject to a business loss limitation. Now, whenever we see losses with taxes, that's, that's going to give us questions. And with rental property, oftentimes a loss situation might be applicable because a lot of times if you you might be investing in richer, more well-off individuals might invest in rental property in the hopes that the rental property goes up in value. 
that's in that case, that part of the property we might consider kind of passive in nature. They're investing and hoping it just goes up because of the scarcity of the property or the location that it's in, it's gonna benefit and the property will basically go up. And then there's also the more active part of the rental property if they actually rent it to somebody, in which case they're gonna be collecting revenue and they're gonna to have to do some work to collect the revenue, manage uh, to collect the revenue and so on and so forth. But you can, you can understand that if you buy property that you're hoping it's gonna go up in value, that's kind of a, a hedge against other assets going down like the stock market or something like that, then, then you, you might not really be aiming at a real gain on the rental part of the property because you're, you're still benefiting from just holding on to the property, hoping it, it goes up in value. So you might be running the rental property at basically uh, a loss that might be fairly common because of the nature of the rental property and how people might hold the rental property. And the IRS, of course, is going to be skeptical of losses because if you get a loss on the rental property, then you might be able to take that loss against other income, as we have seen in prior courses or sections on the Schedule C. So the Schedule C, if you have a service type of business, now you're actively working. So it's not like you have a passive income thing on the Schedule C. If I'm a tax preparer and I lose money on the Schedule C, it's not like I'm possibly making passive income on, on just my business, right? Because on location, I have to build my reputation, build my goodwill day to day, you know, job by job. Whereas again, if you have property, the, you might have a passive component to it where the property kind of uh, might go up in value just in terms of scarcity of the property or because of location. So with the Schedule C, it makes more sense if I'm a service business, I get to take that deduction or that loss against other income, maybe W-2 income, which is often also related to labor. But the IRS is going to say, wait, with the rental income, maybe we don't want to let you take that deduction against other income like W-2 income because of the nature of the rental property. So this is where the rub, this is where the tension comes in with the rental property. One reason it needs to be reported on a separate schedule than a Schedule C uh, is because it has different rules possibly with relation to the losses, possibly with relation to whether it should be categorized as passive uh, or not. And you can see the debate's going to go back and forth because some people are going to say, hey, I actively participate in my rental property and it's my job. I do it. I do it from day to day and so on. And, and therefore, I should be able to take a loss. And, other, and then the IRS is going to say, yeah, but there's this passive component to it. And so we don't think it should be you should get those same kind of benefits as if you're like a service to take it against other income. And then we end up with some kind of compromised situations, limiting some of the losses, for example, possibly recorded on the Schedule E or possibly in some cases on a Schedule C and so on. And we'll dive more into that uh, in future presentations. So the disallowed loss resulting from the limit will not be reflected on line 26, 32, 37, or 39 of your Schedule E. Instead, use Form 461 to determine the amount of your excess business loss, which will be included as income on Schedule 1, Form 1040, Line 8P. Any disallowed loss resulting from this limitation will be treated as net operating loss that must be carried forward and deducted in subsequent year. So if we are limited to losses for any of these reasons, uh, then, then the question is, do I just lose the loss permanently? that would seem unfair. So typically, I should be able to take the loss against other income at some future at some future period. So whatever the reason we lost, we got a reduction of the loss because it was excess business loss, or because there was a passive limitation, or whatever, then then the question is, can I take that against future income, possibly the rental income, possibly passive income, or just income uh, normal income, other income in the future. So C form 461 and its instructions for details on the excess business loss limitation. Introduction. So do you own a second house uh, that you rent out all the time? So if you're a more well-off individual, then you might have a second home and that might be the place that you're that you're renting. So do you own a vacation home that you rent out when you or your family isn't using it? 
So this is one of the complications that come into play with rental property because you might hold rental property as basically a vacation home, which you might visit you know, from time to time, which makes it not business property completely, but partially personal property. So now you end up with this question of how do I deal with this second home? If it was a second home, I might be able to deduct like the mortgage interest and possibly real estate taxes on the Schedule A. But if I rent it, then I might be able to deduct those things and possibly other things and possibly even have a loss to deduct on a Schedule uh, E uh, situation. So we have this question of, remember that the basic idea with bookkeeping and accounting and business, we want to keep the business separate from the personal. That's difficult when you're using a property partially for business, partially for personal because it's a vacation home that you're visiting part of the year. Okay, so these are two common types of residential rental activities discussed in this publication. In most cases, all rental income must be reported on your tax return, but there are differences in the expenses you are allowed to deduct and in the way the rental activity is reported uh, on your return. So here's the, some common scenarios. You have one house and you rent part of that house to somebody else. What do you do with that? Because now you have the one home and you're renting part of it. Or you have two homes and the second home is being rented. So maybe it's completely rental property, but it's the second home. Or you have the second home that you're renting and you use part of it as a vacation home periodically or possibly for part of the year. Now, in any of those scenarios, if you get paid income, the income is basically income, right? Unless it's a very low amount of income or, you know, generally the idea is any rental income you get is income because obviously the income you got wasn't for the personal use of the property. In other words, if you had a vacation home and you used it partially for vacation home and you rented it part of the year, the income that you're getting doesn't need to be allocated between your personal and business use because the rental income is clearly all from the rental use. It has nothing to do with the personal part of the year that you used it. But the expenses may need to be allocated because the expenses on the upkeep of the home are now benefiting both the business and personal. So we need some kind of ratio analysis to say these expenses partially our personal because I use it as a vacation home and partially our business because we used it as a rental place. And so that's where the complications will come in because we have this mix up. We have this commingling of personal and business and it's going to come to play on that expense calculation. Chapter one, how do we deal with this? Chapter one discusses rental for property activity in which there is no personal use of the property. So that's going to be the easiest example where we don't have a mixing, a commingling. The second home or whatever, the property is used totally for rental. We're not using it as a vacation home. It examines some common types of rental income and when each is reported, as well as some common types of expenses and when each is deductible. Chapter two, discuss depreciation as it applies to your rental real estate activity, what property can be depreciated and how much it can be depreciated. So rental property or depreciation becomes important because the property itself subject to depreciation because now it's being used as like a business kind of a situation with the rental property. And typically when you're fixing things, you're going to have a lot of depreciable items. In other words, is it a repair that you might be able to expense or is it something that you have to record as a, a depreciable item? Chapter three covers the reporting of your rental income and deductions, including casualties and thefts, limitations on losses, and claiming the correct amount of depreciation. So th that losses situation, again, is, is one of the areas that's commonly an issue because many people that are investing in rental property might have a loss because of the nature of rental property and the passive component to it. And then the question is, how do you account for uh, the loss, what kind of limitations might be there with regards to the loss. Chapter four discusses special rental situations. This includes uh, condominiums, cooperatives, property changed to rental use, renting only part of your property and a not-for-profit rental activity. So condominiums and cooperatives, a little bit of 
you know, special situations, property changed, that's quite common, right? So, so if you're changing property to rental use, you know, what are going to be some hurdles that happen there? And only part of your, your part of your property is being rented. That's quite common as well, because you might have a home and you're renting part of the home, for example. So chapter five discusses the rule for rental income and expenses when there is also personal use of the dwelling unit, such as a vacation home. So now instead of co-mingling, instead of having this business and personal situation with one property that has a business and personal part to it, you have a separate property, but that separate property is a vacation home used partially for business, partially for personal, not as your primary home, but as a vacation home, renting it possibly the, ne the rest of the year. Chapter six explains how to get the tax help from the IRS sale or exchange of rental property. So for information on how to figure and report any gain or loss from the sale, exchange, or other disposition of your rental property, see publication 544. So when you sell the rental property, then you're going to have a situation of possibly a gain. Now notice if you have a home, like a house, if it's your personal residence, then, uh, then when you sell the property, you might get this massive exclusion because it was your, your primary residence. And therefore, you can have a pretty large gain that might get kind of wiped out for federal income tax purposes because of that exclusion. But if it were rental property, you have a second home, but it's not, it's not a second, it's not your primary residence. Now it's being a rental property. Now you're using it for business use and you're depreciating it as you don't typically do with your home. You don't record depreciation on your home for taxes because you don't get a deduction for the depreciation. Instead, the basis or cost, the adjusted basis remains what it is. And then when you sell it, you're going to calculate the gain or loss at the point of sale, which will often be wiped out with the exclusion of the principal residence. With a secondary home, you've got the, the, the cost or depreciation of the home or the cost of the basis of the home is going to go down as you depreciate it, depreciating being one of the primary expenses, the use or consumption of the home, the building part, not the land part is depreciated. That results that when you sell the home, you're more likely to have a gain because the basis is going to be lower. And that means that the sales price minus the cost or adjusted basis will be higher. And because it's not your principal residence, then you're, you're likely to have a, a gain calculation there. So note there's a bunch of, if you have a second home, you might think about, well, what if I took my principal residence and then I moved in to the second home and lived there to make it my principal residence and then I sold it so that, so that the gain is going to be excluded and this and that. So you, can, you could try to get into those kind of tax planning strategies that might be in retirement. There's also 1031 exchange situations uh, that could come into play with uh, with real estate and rental property on the selling side uh, of things. So that's a whole nother topic that you can basically dive into in more detail. Sale of main home used as rental property. So for information on how to figure and report any gain or loss from the sale of other dispositions of your main home that you also used as rental property, see publication 523. So if your main home, part of it was used as rental property, that's going to that's gonna complicate things, of course, because the part that was used as rental property, you would think might not be subject to this big exemption be, that you would get with your principal residence. It could complicate basically that whole situation. And you might have been getting deductions for depreciation for the part of the property that was the rental prop part of the property. So... Keep those things in mind because, because when you sell the home, it's, it's you could end up with this large gain, right? And the question is, you would like to be able to be exempt from that gain uh, if at all possible, which you might be able to do if it was your personal, uh, if it was your personal residence. So these are just things, there's an interplay between depreciation and the basis of the property which will play itself out when you sell the property, the more depreciation, the larger your gain will be. And then there's this whole issue of 
if it was your principal residence, you might be able to get an exclusion from the gain, but if it's rental property, then you don't get the exclusion from for the gain. And then again, you can throw in as well the idea of a 1031 exchange, which is another topic. So tax-free exchange of rental property occasionally used for personal purposes. So if you meet certain qualif qualifying use standards, you may qualify for a tax-free exchange, otherwise known as a like-kind or Section 1031 exchange of one piece of property you own for a similar piece of property, even if you have used the rental property for personal purposes. So now you have a situation where you, you, you want, the idea here is that if there's a big tax consequence between selling the rent the real estate and then buying another piece of real estate it's going to stop people from selling the real estate because they don't want to be hit with this big tax consequence that really has possibly built up over a long period of time because it's not like those gains happened in one year they've happened over the lifetime as you've owned the property so so the idea here would be well if you exchanged the property then we can treat it kind of as though you didn't actually sell it because basically after the exchange, you're in the same situation. So you have another piece of property that's like kind. It's similar in nature. So instead of us recognizing the gain on the sale, what if we just basically put the, uh, the original adjusted basis into the new property so that you will recognize the gain when you sell the second piece of property so that we're just basically deferring the gain into the future. Now that's kind of the idea. It gets more complicated though, because it's not like you're exchanging property for property. There's a third party, you know, in play. You're buying a different piece, you're selling to someone different and buying a different piece of property. So the 1031, that's kind of the concept of the 1031 exchange. It gets somewhat complicated in application because of all these different components. You're selling property and then someone else is purchasing the property, but you're trying to transfer the basis over into the new property. The new property is probably gonna have some cash part of the transaction involved in it, which means you're still gonna have some adjustments to the depreciation and whatnot and so on. So there are companies that basically specialize simply in you know, 1031 exchanges, and you wanna make sure that if you're thinking about a 1031 exchange, that you figure out exactly how to execute it properly that you've kind of thought through it uh, in that situation. So just another one to kind of keep in mind, that's a whole nother course or section uh, in and of itself. But for more information on the quali on qualifying use standards, you can see Revenue Procedure 2008-16-2008-10 IRB547. It's available on the IRS website. So useful items you may want to see. So you have publications that you could check out that are related to this topic, rental property. You got 463, travel, gift, and car expenses. So these are things that could come up in like business situation, especially that car expense situation. Uh, publication 523, selling your home. That's gonna be, be somewhat related to the rental property because again, you might be in the situation of saying, how can I make it my principal residence? For example, what's going to be the gain when I sell the home and so on. Publication 534, depreciating property placed in service before 1987. Publication 544, sales and other disposition of assets. So when we sell assets that are depreciable. Uh, publication 547, casualties, disaster and thefts. Publication 551, basis of assets. Uh, publication 925, passive activity and at-risk rules might touch in on those because the rental property possibly could be thought of as a passive activity and you might have at-risk rules that apply as well, which we might touch on. Publication 946, how to depreciate property and then the forms and instructions for form 461, excess business loss limitations form 4562 depreciation and amortization form 5213 uh, election to postpone determination as to whether the presumption applies that an activity is engaged in for profit form 7205 energy efficient commercial building deduction 
Form 8582, Passive Activity Loss Limitations. Form 8960, Net Investment Income, Tax, Individual, Estate, and Trust. And then Schedule E, Supplemental Income and Loss. Obviously, rental property has a lot of different components to it. And we have a lot of different kind of variants of types of rental property. So there's a lot of tangents that we can go on for uh, a long time. We're going to go into basically the heart of it, the main components of it in future presentations.